another edition of the Energy Week podcast. Ryan Ray, along Dr. Energy herself, Ellen Wald. Ellen, how's it going? It is all good news here. It is good news here, but not in some of the <laughs> articles we're going to cover today. Because it's, 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 we have a lot of, a lot of depressing news out this week, it seems like. Good news here, not such good news for a lot of people in the energy world. You know, I didn't think of that when I was culling for interesting things to talk about, that this was like the most depressing group of articles to come up with. <laughs> well, we do have one potentially bright spot towards the end, but let's start with depressing um, from CNBC. Keystone XL suffers another setback as judge blocks most work on the oil pipeline. Basically, the judge is allowing them to move the pipe around to the pipe yards. But anything other than that, how dare you, don't go there, not on my watch. It's like, could they be more micromanaged? Like, what have we come to in this country where you need a judge to tell you whether or not you can move, like, workers to a potential work site? But, you know, you can't do that. But, oh, you can you could maybe move the pipeline. I mean, this is getting to be entirely ridiculous. I mean, this is, this is the same judge who, uh, what, what was it that he did before? One of the economic analysis or something like that. Outlook or viability of the project, something something along those lines. It's like, I, I, if I was Trans Canada, I probably would have given up by this point. Although I guess they've invested so much in it that they're just not. But I, I, it's like, how many times can you kick someone when they're down? <laughs> I've been watching The Sopranos my second time through, oh, and it well, feels there like, you go. <laughs> yeah, it feels very, very much like you know when the mobsters go and they find someone and they don't just beat him up; they continue to beat the poor fellow up <laughs> to the point of death. I don't even know what to say. It's like like the fact that this is news. I was a little disappointed by this article, honestly. I wanted a little bit more context. Like, is this a normal thing for a judge to, you know, issue something saying you can't, you know, do this? Is is it normal to, to say, no, you may not, um, you know, get your pre-construction things done? Right. Or is this special because this is the most talked about pipeline in the history of all pipelines? So – Two things. First off, if you're a lawyer out there, I would love for you to email us or connect us on LinkedIn or Twitter or whatever and let us know, as Ellen said, is this normal? But secondly, um, is there a way in which Keystone, assuming the pipeline gets built, they could then sue the federal government for, as Ellen's pointing out here, being micromanaged and saying that um, the judicial system went too far and, and, and caused them harm? Or is there any damages that they, they could potentially be awarded? I'd love to know that answer. But the, the second part, Ellen... We're, we're having a discussion. We're actually having a debate on the Texas Long Guest podcast here in a few weeks between two lawyers on the issue of eminent domain. So we've been talking about it pretty regularly on the podcast. And, you know, my, my general thesis is free markets, property rights, things like that. But when it comes to uh, eminent domain and stuff like this, I, I'm a little torn. And, and here's kind of how I laid it out. And this will tie into how Keystone is on some level. Um in a perfect theoretical free market society, you could build a refinery anywhere you wanted to. Um, and so therefore, you could at least make the argument that the pipeline company could build a refinery in Washington State, let's say, or Oregon or wherever on the West Coast, and figure out a route to get the, the pipeline there. You could make that argument. Um, but in this case, that's not how it works. It's just not a realistic thing. Now, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing or not, we could talk about. But it, it, it's... I'm not saying that the private company should be able to go and just take land as will, but it's also the government is regulating where they can build these facilities at, um, which gives them, as big as the United States is, it actually gives them a very narrow window, uh, relatively speaking, on where they can go. And you might say, well, Ryan, from you know the Canadian border to Texas is a wide open gap. Yes, but, but I mean, you've got big cities you got to go around. You've got federal lands you got to deal with. Um, you've got all these things, and so the, the gap's probably a lot tighter, and you're talking about big volume pipe. It's not as easy to turn it as it, as it is a two-inch or four-inch pipeline. What is your thoughts generally on um, you know, how to look at eminent domain? Yeah, I mean, eminent domain is a big, a big question, and, and uh, you know, I, <laughs> I, it's like, would I want to be one of those people whose you know, property is being taken by eminent domain? But at the same time, it is... You know, that does actually seem to me like a, like that is something the federal government should be involved in. In this case, 
I mean, is it, it's like a federal judge in Montana. I mean, like, is this really an issue for the federal government? I mean, it's like, mm-hmm. I mean, come on, like the, he's ruling that they cannot do work to prepare for construction because they're waiting for some sort of environmental impact in Nebraska. I mean, is that right. the, the reason? I, mean, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I, I should have written to, I know the guy who wrote this article and I, I kind of wish I'd like sent him a message and said, you know, but you know, what, what was his rationale for not right. allowing this? Because that was kind of missing from this piece. And I really would have liked to know that. Right. And, and the, yeah, the final thing is I would say is that when you talk about these big, these big long pipelines, it's not as if you can go and acquire all of the right away um, in a day, you know, so this is a process of acquiring a right away, which builds your route. And so that's part of the issue here is you can't acquire, you know, from coast to coast, if you will, um, right away, overnight so therefore you have to say this is generally where we want to go and that's the argument for eminent domain i, I agree with you i wouldn't want my land taken either um, by force but it, it's it's a very tricky thing and and finally on this issue is as we're talking about a minute ago uh, in, in a minute rather with the canadian oil industry um what would you rather them do we said, said this before what would this i would i would like you know if i was trans Canada, it didn't work like this i would present the alternative to how the oil will be transported and then look at the judge and say is this better because we know that rail is not better than pipelines, so yeah, exactly. It, they're just, uh, and uh, but I also think there's an element of power here. I think they like sticking it to, you know, the president or, or whatnot that they could say, no, we're going to block your project. I, I do really believe there is an element of of power. Right. And are that's you saying that judges are susceptible to being human beings as well, uh-huh. <laughs> even <laughs> though, relaxed. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, now who knows? Now they're saying they may push the earliest construction date on this pipeline to 2020. And that is not what Alberta uh, oil producers wanted to hear. Right. Right. No, it's a very complicated issue on the philosophical side of how we should handle all this stuff. But where we stand today, it feels like this is political maneuvering more than anything else. And that that's what makes it frustrating. Um, and so, but I I, I feel like... They're so far in that they're gonna they're gonna keep going and they're gonna have to. I, I said they're gonna have to. They're gonna get the project done. I mean, I still feel that it's going to happen. Yeah, I do think that it. I mean, I do think it is going to happen because there's no way around it. I mean, you can do a million environmental impact studies, but at the end of the day, at a certain point, you know, they they're either gonna do it or Trans Canada is gonna pull out. And I don't think Trans Canada has any intention of pulling out at this point. And at, you know. At some point, they're not going to be able to delay it anymore. Right. Okay, now let's go to Reuters, and they have an exclusive from a, quote, source. Indian advises refiner to avoid to avoid U.S. system for Venezuela oil buying. Um, it, 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 we've talked about this with the Iranian sanctions, about how they would handle um, you know, the U.S.'s control over the banks, and we can talk about whether that's good or bad or not, but it's just kind of the reality. Um, India was part of those discussions back then too. Is India kind of leading the charge here to get out, get away from the U.S. banking system? India wants oil, and it wants it now, and it wants it cheap, and it wants it will pay. You know, it's it it it, it is more than happy to not pay in dollars. The issue here seems to be that they don't want that. They're, they're saying that PDVSA is telling India, "Don't pay us through the American." Um, banking through the U.S. banking system because, as U.S. has said, they're going to basically take that money and put it in a holding account because they don't want it to go to PDVSA, which is controlled still by the Maduro government. So, uh, meanwhile, so India still recognizes Maduro as Venezuela's leader, so it's not going to um, put the money in the escrow account for Guaido um, willingly. So, basically. They're, they're trying to tell India, you know, well, don't do it. You know, don't don't try to use it because the U.S. will just take your money, which is basically true. Um, it's kind of interesting because India has actually – so India is Venezuela's second largest market for oil after the U.S. And their Reliance Industries Limited, which is – they operated a very big refinery in India um, – 
and also Naraya energy, which is part owned now by Rosneft and Trafigura, are have been the two Indian buyers of Venezuelan oil. But I'm pretty sure I read that Trafigura is no longer going to be participating in buying Venezuelan oil. Yeah, here it says Trafigura has decided to stop trading oil with Venezuela due to the sanctions. Uh, we don't know exactly what Reliance and Naraya are doing, but um, the Venezuelan oil minister, Manuel Quevedo, went to India to try to convince refiners to boost their purchases. And the interesting thing is that India and Iran now have this deal, I think, where India is going to pay them in rupees, or Iran is going to accept some rupees for oil. So I wonder if they'll attempt to set something similar up with Venezuela the longer this impasse goes on. And if Venezuela will accept rupees, I'm not really sure what Venezuela is going to do with rupees. Um, India and Iran, ha you know, they're a lot closer than India and Venezuela and India and Iran have, um, you know, decent trade. So, so basically what Iran does is it just the rupees go into an account and then Iran uses that account to buy products and whatnot from India using those rupees, which doesn't help the Iranian government's balance sheet all that much, but is mm -hmm. helpful, you know, to um, getting certain things that they need. Uh, I'm not quite sure that that kind of thing would work with Venezuela, considering that the Venezuelan currency is basically worthless and they don't produce anything that India would use except oil. <laughs> so one thing I thought about on this piece is if you hear, uh, I guess use the soprano analogy again, but if you hear, um, you know, white collar criminals and, you know, they're, they, they hide their money in Swiss banks and cause they, they feel the Caymans cause they feel that protected. It, is that just, is, are those banks not large enough to handle this kind of volume or it, why are we not? Cause at least for the common folk, that's kind of the, the myth. Maybe it is that you can go to those banks, get protection. Um, is that not really applicable for a country wide level type of transaction? Yeah, my guess is they don't handle transactions like for oil and that kind of stuff, or they won't handle large enough transactions, or, um, you know, they have to adhere to sanctions. They can keep your money secret and they'll like launder it, but they're not going to go against actual sanctions. <laughs> <That's> so. <laughs> They'll hide it from the feds, but not those feds. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they'll hide from the IRS, but they right. won't hide it from, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I, I don't know, not being an expert in um, how you would hide money in the Cayman Islands. It's an interesting question. I don't know anyone in the Cayman or, or Swiss banking system that I could ask, unfortunately. Right. However, right. if there are listeners who happen to be experts on this and would like to, you know, fill us in, that'd be great. My sense, though, is that there's like a lot of intermediaries that you go through to get the oil. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know. And that those banks probably don't deal with them. Yeah. I'm just, I, I'm just thinking you got something like that, which it might be a volume issue, but if you wanted to say that crypto is the future, this would seem to be these types of cases where crypto, um, obviously you have issues with converting it to your local currency and you know, there's, I guess there's solutions to that problem, obviously, but it seemed like this would be the time and the case where you'd come and say, this is when we switch to crypto because if we're doing crypto, whether it's uh, Bitcoin or, or whatever, um, this keeps us to be able to do these transactions. Um, and and I, so I understand. I guess maybe this is where my ignorance comes in, but I understand what you're saying about well, they got these, they've got these dollars, and it doesn't work for these rupees. But essentially, if their government works like ours, they just print money. So I don't know why you couldn't say, well, we're we're swapping our Bitcoin coins or whatever you want to call them for our, our local currency and then give that to the people. Um, and then the countries could deal on a Bitcoin thing. I, I wonder if it's, if it's is, is it really that big of a hassle or is it more of the governments understand that once they open up the Bitcoin coffers that they won't get income taxes because then no one's, no one's ever going to pay taxes because they're traded Bitcoin. Yeah, well, I mean, Venezuela did try to set up its own yeah. Petro Bitcoin, yeah. so. Yeah, that's true. And, and surprisingly, because it failed with Venezuela, it's weird how Venezuela has that track record now. <laughs> I, I just, I just, I just, I, 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 I mean, just, I mean, I don't, I don't know all of the, all of the logistics, but if you're being very practical, um, you know, the U.S. just prints money, not necessarily based upon anything. Um, so exchanging something, which Bitcoin is based upon nothing, for something based upon nothing, I don't see where the why that would be. Um, so hard what is there something i'm missing there that would make me i think no one trusts the venezuelan petro 
Well, no, no, no. I'm saying you could, you could use Bitcoin itself or. Oh, hmm. I don't know. I mean, at some point, you got to trade the Bitcoin for actual currency, and. Right, but your currency, but you you determine you you determine how much your currency is in place. So you know, it's it's if it was a gold standard issue, I could. I can understand if you're on the gold standard or something like that. You'd say, "Well, we got the gold; we can't do it," you know. But 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 here, it's just it's all fiat money. So I don't understand why that's uh, that's uh, such a such a big to do. But it it is interesting to see this momentum to say, "Hey, you know, with these sanctions, um, there is a pushback on the U.S.'s ability to to wade in on um, foreign foreign countries' ability to you know do business." And that's you know, some, it feels like something's got to give. I don't know how that ultimately pans out, but. Um, speaking of greener pastures, let's go to BP Renewables and Natural Gas to dominate energy growth, according to BP. Um, I pulled up some numbers because we actually talked about natural gas this morning on the Texas Oil and Gas podcast, Ellen. And we got a report from, from Drilling Info a few weeks ago. And essentially, looking at the, the price of natural gas from October of last year to today, or I'm sorry, uh, January 21st, it's basically the same. In between there, it went up to almost five dollars, four eighty-ish, somewhere in that range. Um, and then so you had a short little, short little uh, rise in prices, and then it um, fell off the mark. But the other thing that was interesting is production since two thousand ten, I think, is up like twenty-five percent, something like that, and it's up like eighty percent. Uh, I would say eight percent, I think, over the last year. And if you go back and look at historic natural gas prices, you see that. Natural gas from 2010, the same period, was at six dollars and eleven cents, January 2010, and as of this report, which is a little bit more up to date, February of this year is at two seventy six. So, despite the fact we've lost, you know, three dollars and change on the price, production is up twenty five percent. It just kind of blew my mind. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I think it's worth discussing this because a lot of people look at the BP, uh, you know, the BP outlook in terms mm-hmm. of this, but it's interesting because certain things made headlines that I'm not sure were really, you know, all that, that I'm not sure that the headlines are really telling us the real story here, Mm -hmm. because first of all, the outlook is, look, it's central scenario is a future in which renewable energy sources will account for 85% of the world's energy growth in the run up to 2040, 85% of the world's energy growth. Do they have any idea how much, I mean, maybe they think most, okay. And, and well, okay. It says it includes wind, solar, bi- geothermal, biomass, and biofuels. And okay. And, okay. Future much renewable energy and natural gas mm-hmm. that I buy, although mm-hmm. I'm a little con- wondering why they did not include hydroelectric in renewable energy, because hydroelectric usually makes up the bulk of renewable energy sources in any country, except for Saudi Arabia, which has no rivers. So no hydro (laughs) hey (laughs) yeah um but like in in many many in in a lot of countries it makes up the bulk of renewables which makes sense i mean hydro is a a great source of energy but it's like okay so they really but plus natural gas is going to account for 85 percent of the world's energy growth basically that's just saying nuclear is just not going anywhere and and yet and yet like somehow this is like means the end of oil right and i just think that that's uh, I, I, they make these scenarios and then they like craft them to sound like what they want i don't know like like the message that they want to send you know and it just bothers me so much like the like okay apparently this report puts so much emphasis on the ban on single use plastics mm-hmm. so that means that ban on straws at restaurants right. and on plastic bags at um at at stores okay but here's the thing now where i live we don't have a ban on plastic bags and i will admit that i do not always bring my my reusable bags and sometimes i get plastic bags i don't consider them single use because i reuse them for all sorts of things around the house but after another use they do end up getting thrown away i will admit it okay how dare you i know and <laughs> I will also admit that I do not enjoy using paper straws. Uh, I was at a very nice, very nice. I was at a nice restaurant. 